Welcome to Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our website is libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today we are discussing with Frank Buckley, his new book, The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America. Frank Buckley is a foundation professor of law at George Mason School of Law and the author of three books, The Morality of Laughter, Just Exchange, A Theory of Contract, and Fair Governance. Frank, I'm delighted to have you on the program and uh, talk about your new book, The Once and Future King. Richard, thanks very much for having me. So I thought the subtitle of the book, uh, it's a provocative uh, uh, phrase, The Rise of Crown Government in America. Sketch for us what you mean there. What I mean is that we seem to have returned to a principle of monarchical government, which reminds one of the situation in the American colonies prior to the uh, Revolution. That was a time when power resided importantly in the executive, and that seems to be where we're headed. I want to ask you, and this maybe I misread you or or missed some some, uh, complicating uh, rationales here, but... You, you argue, on the one hand, early in the book, that uh, America, Canada, and the U.K. are all experiencing, are all experiencing a growth of power, tremendous power in the executive branch. And yet, at the other end, you seem to argue, and I mean, this is what makes your book so interesting, parliamentary governments produce greater levels of economic and political freedom uh, than presidential ones do. Uh, and, and America, of course, is, is the standout there. So can you kind of walk us through that tension, or is it, or is it not tension? Am I missing something? Yeah, I can, uh, but that relates to a number of other things. When I'm talking about levels of economic freedom, I'm simply piggybacking on studies or reports of other bodies, such as Heritage or Fraser or Cato, which rank America in terms of economic freedom behind a whole bunch of other countries in the first world. Yeah, I think we're like 18 are These chiefly are presidential or parliamentary governments. Okay. Um, but so let me think about this. But all of all of the governments, uh, the, or say the three big Anglo-American democracies, uh, I mean Australia, we, we're not we should throw them in, but uh, are all kind of experiencing this growth in executive power right now, which has been so prominent in the last few years, and in, in, in the media anyway, and what Ob- President Obama has been doing. Right. Um, when I spoke about freedom and the danger that presidential government poses to liberty, what I had in mind was something more than simply those rankings to which we referred a moment ago. What I had in mind was the way in which presidential governments have, in other countries, morphed into one-man rule, uh, a direction in which we seem to be heading. Uh, The American system has produced... uh, liberty for Americans for more than 200 years, but it seemingly was not a constitution made for export because what it gave the countries that adopted it were tin pot dictators, uh, largely. Whereas parliamentary government, the Westminster model, exported in the first instance through Canada and then to 50 other countries with a combined population of 2 billion people, produce countries that are simply freer Now here, when I say free, what I'm referring to is rankings of Freedom House, a think tank, which which ranks countries in terms of a a whole bunch of variety of of, of criteria, but, but chiefly political freedom. Uh, just thinking about that claim briefly, and I want you did some really interesting uh, uh, scholarship on the Constitutional Convention, and perhaps a different um, uh, original intention, perhaps, for the uh, interworkings or the deliberations between the executive branch and the congressional branch, perhaps much different than than what's actually played out. And I want to get to that. But uh, thinking about these Freedom House rankings and the parliamentary governments being freer, uh, the ones that you cite, if I remember correctly, 1972 through 2010. I wonder if it would be different if it was a longer time period, say the last hundred years, if those numbers would still would still be the same. I guess, I mean, they wouldn't, but 
what would we see actually America being a, a much stronger example? Well, if, of yeah, if, 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 if you go back earlier than that, firstly, you'll go back before a time when there is Freedom House data, so there is oh. a data limitation. Yeah. And secondly, you'd be running into fairly nasty things like the Second World War and fascism and things like that. So we take the data as we find it, and, and uh, it starts in 72, and it stops around now. Um, and, and, and my finding is, uh, it, it's, it's not an odd finding. It's really what everyone who's looked at the data has reported, namely that parliamentary governments tend to produce more political freedom or more politically more free than presidential governments. So that, that part of it isn't really very controversial. And remember what we're doing here is we're comparing all presidential governments with all parliamentary governments, you know, excluding the Cubas and, and communist China and all that. Um, and, and, and what you get is, is non-controversially a finding that presidential governments haven't been good for liberty. Um, now, America is the great exception, of course. Yes. America and, and one or two other presidential go governments like um, mixed regimes like France. Uh, just you know, thinking about uh, the data, and, and I'm not a data guy. I'm more of a, a theory and history guy. But I, I guess uh, some, some questions that come to mind, too, is so the countries that did adopt the presidential system or presidential model like America um, um, – uh, what did they start with, I think, or, or what, what are they actually trying to build on? Uh, and also thinking about just where are they? Are they random or are they geographically clustered? And so we might see some, some sort of problems with, you know, what the people are actually desiring those systems to do uh, in a particular part of the world, maybe. That's, uh, that's a good point. And uh, a lot of the presidential regimes are uh, in South America. Yeah, and okay. South American countries have not been favorable to liberty. Now, um, it, when I did my regressions, I added a South American or Latin American variable to try to take care of that, to split that off, to, to take that out of the mix and to try to find the pure consequence of parliamentary versus presidential. So I, I tried to take that into account in, in, in the way that one does in these, in, 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 when one does econometrics. Uh, thinking, uh, and I want to go back to your founder's argument here, so switching fields and thinking about uh, George Mason, uh, the namesake of, of your university and your law school, and you argue that in the Constitutional Convention, uh, he makes an interesting argument about uh, the president becoming an elective monarchy, and we've kind of referred to that here in the beginning. Um, talk about that argument and what you think the Philadelphia Convention may actually have intended uh, for the presidency, that it, it actually was to be closely, more, more closely monitored and we're supposed to have something in practice at least more resembling of a, of a parliamentary uh, government. Let, let me start by saying that um, when I began this, I simply looked at parliamentary versus presidential. And then I felt a little embarrassed at... Uh, in reporting that uh, the American system was less than ideal. That, that's not a message that uh, would commend itself to too many Americans. The identity of Americans as Americans is wrapped up in the founding documents, the Declaration, and chiefly the Constitution. So if you say there's a problem with the Constitution, you're saying, well, there's a problem with being American. That doesn't sound quite right. So what I then did was I, I, I looked at the framers' debates and I was struck, first of all, at, at really how little one does or how infrequently one looks at, at, at the notes of the convention. Mostly when people want to talk about the framers, they talk about the Federalist Papers, which was the product of two people who were really quite in the outs in Philadelphia. Uh, Hamilton so embarrassed himself with his quasi-monarchical sentiments that... Uh, that he really skipped town in the middle of it and only came back at the end. And Madison himself, Madison himself produced a, uh, a brilliant document, uh, the framework for a great constitution, except it was the Constitution of Canada, not of the United States. I'm referring to the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan. So I, 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 I then looked at, more carefully at, at what the Federalist Papers were all about. And, I thought, firstly, it's a selling document meant to persuade people. That, that's, that's fair enough. Um, written by two people on the outs, two people who didn't agree with most of the people in the convention and didn't even agree with each other. 
people who really didn't think what they had produced was all that satisfactory. Madison, at the very end, uh, wrote to Jefferson and said, this is terrible. And, and, and almost in the last day, he agreed with a proposal by George Mason that um, the cabinet of the president be appointed by Congress, which would have been something like close to parliamentary government. Um, moreover, Hamilton had his own axe to grind in terms of energy in the executive, as he put it in Federalist 70. I've heard Harvey Mansfield talk about the Federalist Papers very often, and he almost seemed to lick his lips when he talked about energy in the executive. Harvey Mansfield. When I went back then to the Framers' debates, I detected a split between conservatives today. One has, on the one hand, the national greatness conservatives exemplified by Harvey, and another set of conservatives more concerned with preserving liberty uh, represented t today in part by the Pauls, father and son, but also represented by most of the people, or many of the people certainly at the convention, the Roger Shermans, the George Masons, and so on. And I, I, looking at the framers' debates, realized that there's an enormous difference between their debates and and. The, the, the Coles note summary of them in the Federalist Papers. The, the framers' debates, uh, which no one reads, are the greatest set of deck. You read them at Liberty Fund. <laughs> on the, well, they're, they're online in Liberty Fund, but they're not published in hardback. No, we do a lot of conferences. And, on, I was just kidding. I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Well, <clears throat> I mean, the framers' debates are. It's. it's constitute not only the the most sophisticated set of dispositions on the subject of the structure of liberty and government, but they have all the passion of the most exciting set of arguments you could ever find on the subject. You have people who are threatening to secede. You have some people saying, so we split up into three countries. What's wrong with that? You have other people saying... Uh, if you try to split up, we'll invade you, and we'll deal with you through the hangman's noose. One of the delegates, it said, was in the service of a British spy. In the midst of all of this, a old woman was stoned to death, not five blocks from Independence Hall. Uh, you could not find more drama or more passion or more intelligence or more wisdom in a set of debates about the Constitution, and yet... What we get in its place is a rather dry as dust summary in the Federalist Papers. So if then you look at the debates, what you find is a strong concern for the problem of monarchy and government, an elected monarchy. And I think that characterizes most of the delegates. They had an abhorrence for democracy. And in particular, they didn't want an elected president. If the present American government, the structure of the present American government, had been put to them, they would have voted it down, and indeed they did. There were four votes taken on whether the president should be elected, defeated each time. The um, question of whether Congress should appoint the president came up, uh, I think, six times and was voted in four, six times. What they ended up with at the end was something so complicated and so convoluted that um, it takes a while to understand what's going on and one has to know the background to, to, to appreciate it. What they proposed was a constitution not in which presidents would be popularly elected, but where there would be electors who would exercise an independent judgment, they wouldn't be mere ciphers. And secondly, they thought that in 95% of the cases, the election would be kicked over to the House. Under the Constitution, if no candidate receives a majority of votes in the Electoral College, it's kicked over to the House voting by state. And that was roughly what was initially proposed by Madison in the Virginia Plan. So consider what it's like if Congress votes for, if the House, rather, votes for the president. Well, we wouldn't have had, we would have had 
President Romney right now, wouldn't we? So the kinds of battles between presidents and Congress, we wouldn't have seen that so much. Politics would have been more centered in the Congress and, and even drawn down from Congress through this, to the states. Um, and that, that, that understanding seems to have been completely missed by political theorists. I think, I think the, the historians get it better, but the political theorists um, don't quite get it. What I'm arguing, therefore, is that the principle of separation of powers needs to be um, minimized as a grand norm of constitutional interpretation, and that if you wanted to adhere to the ideas of the founders, you should pay more attention to their fears about an overpowerful president. Interesting, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking of one political theorist, Wilmore Kendall, who I think largely would have agreed with your assessment of the convention. He put it in a different way, that the Constitution, as it came from the Philadelphia Convention, had potentialities in it. Uh, and one of those potentialities, maybe the strongest, was to move in the favor of a very powerful Congress that, that controlled the executive through the numerous congressional powers it had un under the Constitution, and yet that doesn't happen. And it, you know, so we don't have a Congress uh, taking away subject matter jurisdiction from the courts. We don't have a Congress using impeachment power strongly or, or liberally or uh, any of those things that are within their toolkit um, because we, from the, almost from the beginning, we have George Washington realizing his institutional need of laying down strong executive power precedents. Uh, and, this, and this starts to guide the country. You mentioned, of course, uh, I mean, fairly early in the Republic, I guess within a generation, uh, the election of 1824. And, and or the election of Andrew Jackson, I should say, and, and what that bodes for executive power and, um, and the, 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 I guess the centralization, the democracy uh, aspect of that um, election. I, I want to think about the separation of powers argument. Um, I guess that it's that it's failed or that it hasn't worked under the tutelage of a strong presidential system. Um, but let me think about the parliamentary system for a minute. Um, and so if you get more political liberty there because the executive has greater accountability to Parliament, and it's more regular accountability. You make that point as opposed to the president, uh, presidential system. But what about the flip side of 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 getting a lot of policies in a hurry? And one, and maybe this is a digression. You know, as I was reading your book, I had in mind uh, this film I watched on Winston Churchill recently, and and it's a three volume film. And the last uh, uh, volume is you know, the election after World War II that Churchill loses to Labor. And we get a lot of really, really muscular social democratic policies after World War II in Britain that we don't get in America. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a part of this majoritarian parliamentary system that stays in place really until Thatcher. I mean, pre-Thatcher, Britain is not necessarily a pretty place for economic liberty. And I, and I just kept thinking, is there something like the separation of powers that, that we lose if, if we go all the way there, that actually the, the prime minister is a very powerful executive. He has majorities behind him a lot, most of the time, much more so than in a presidential system. Interesting you mentioned that. I think that's a very good point. Um, think of this, your point, in terms of the size of government. One thing that's quite interesting is that the relative size of government in the first world, amongst first world nations, is pretty much the same in 1920 across the board, United States, Britain, Canada, and so on. The same is true in 1960, curiously. But then if you go to 1990, all of a sudden, as you say, the parliamentary regimes are have bigger governments. But now... In 2010, now America's played catch-up. So here's roughly what happened. Uh, there was a Keynesian virus that spread through the world, and America resisted it um, better than other countries. But now you, America's played catch-up. And the question is, how do you reverse? So my argument then is that parliamentary governments are quicker to adopt, maybe quicker to adopt bad ideas, but can more easily reverse them. Whereas what America has is a one-way ratchet in which bad ideas are enacted and thereafter turned into the laws of the Medes and the Persians. So you have big government now, I mean, a <laughs> consequent loss of the economic liberties we spoke of, but how do you, uh, 
how do, how do you get around that? How do you reverse that? It's it's not as easy as in a parliamentary government. It's there. It's a simple matter of of winning an, an election and uh, having a majority behind you in the house, and uh, and bang, you can do it. Uh, it. It doesn't happen here. The question then is, what is better? The kind of initial screening that might happen before ideas are first enacted, or the ability to reverse a bad idea. And I think systematically, reversing is more important than pre-enactment screening. And the reason is because you can't really tell how bad a bill is until you've experienced it. That's why reversing is always going to trump pre-enactment screening. By the way, it's not as if there's any pre-enactment screening in this country, is there? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, think of think of Obamacare. Think th- think of uh, the way legislation is made in Washington in the middle of the night by twenty seven year olds uh, eating pizza. You know, it's it's uh, there's 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 little enough of it here to begin with. Uh, I wanted to um, uh, think about that for a moment because I I mean uh, another book that came to mind as I was reading your book uh, by a political scientist last name Pearson dismantling the welfare state and he maybe you're familiar with the book he looks at the Thatcher government and the Reagan administration operating roughly at the same time with kind of uh, same sorts of public opinion behind them and but he argues Thatcher succeeds more so than Reagan did in terms of dismantling social welfare mm-hmm. policies, and, and he lays this at, at the feet of the parliamentary government that she had. So I, I, suppose, uh, I suppose that works in your favor uh, there. Well, I, the, the absolutely stunning example is Canada, which... Uh, dire straits under, as recently under, as the under, end of the under, 20th century. Pardon? Financially. Fiscally, they were, they were in a bad, bad shape in the late 90s, early part of this century. And have, have yeah, come so back. At, that, yeah. at that point, if we're talking about Canada, at that yeah. point, the Wall Street Journal talked about Canada as an honorary member of the Third World. <laughs> uh, that was 1993. But in 1994-95, a liberal government, that is to say a left-of-center government, uh, cut spending 10% across the board and basically solved the fiscal crisis in Canada. Um, so the Canada right now, and 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 they were able to do that because it was a parliamentary government. Uh, whereas now, if you ask which country is the honorary member of the third world as between Canada and the United States, well, I'll tell you it in Canada. Yeah. Well, and maybe there's some other questions coming out that I want to I want to get to. Something that I wanted to ask in thinking about the American government, it, it does seem that the greatest uh, periods of growth in government have been when we have maybe more approximated a parliamentary system. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, obviously FDR's New Deal, particularly, I mean, he's the president who comes up with the idea of the first 100 days, the mandate to lay down legislation. So we have something like, you know, politics is warfare, and he has he has the strong majorities in Congress to do that. So we get the New Deal, which is a, a, a re- almost a revolution in American federal government. And then LBJ's Great Society, the legislation he's able to implement um, as well, uh, which is you know just, still with us to this day, still dealing with the fallout. And so I, I, I guess I, I come back, and I guess your your response is, uh, yeah, but you can't. It's, it's very hard for you to reverse. Uh, I very hard to yeah, reverse, yeah. and it's very hard to impeach. Here's a trivia question: um, the idea that you required the requirement of two thirds approval in the Senate to remove a president was introduced in the very last almost the very last day, on September 4 of the convention, by Governor Morris. And um, I think by Governor Morris. And before then, it was simply 50%. So the trivia question is, before you get a a removal, an impeachment and removal of the president, you need the president in one party, the House in the other party, and two-thirds of the Senate in the other party. And that's happened exactly once in American history. And the trivia question is, when was that? And the answer is 1868. Andrew Johnson. And Yeah, Andrew Johnson. Yeah. And Johnson was saved by one vote, and, and John Kennedy wrote a book, Profiles and Courage, to celebrate the Kansas senator who switched the vote and saved the presidency. And it turned out that, but for that, we would have had a more accountable presidency, and the Kansas senator, it appears, was bribed, and it was really Teddy Sorensen who wrote the book. 
<laughs> Let me mention one other thing about differences between parliamentary and presidential, because it's it's not something that's too easily recognized here, and that is the what I think is the really important difference between a system where you split head of government and head of state and one where the two offices are united. Uh, there is a reverence for presidents in this country which is entirely foreign to people who grew up in the parliamentary regime. I mean, in a parliamentary regime, your politicians are figures of fun. It's okay to laugh at them. Um, if there is a great tragedy, it doesn't require a presidential speech and um, the sobbing of Peggy Noonan to <laughs> heal America, right? Uh, now, you know, we, we may feel great affection for jug-eared princes, but we don't fall down on our knees before President Clinton. Yeah. Uh, it's almost a sickness, it seems to me. A uh, sickness that's seen not only in the suggestions of disloyal behavior when you criticize the president, but all, even in the hatred of presidents. The, 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 the um, Bush derangement syndrome of the of 10 years ago was like the feeling of a spurned lover. One desperately wanted to love one's president, and if one couldn't love him, then one had to hate him. Um, I, I regarded that, that all of that seemed to me rather sick-making, both the, the, the love of the president and, and, and the extreme hatred. Um, better to think of them as comical figures. Something that, uh, and, and I was thinking of this at the beginning of our discussion and uh, thinking about the Electoral College and uh, thinking about uh, Congress and, you know, and not having a popularly elected presidents is kind of the term deliberative democracy, uh, which has largely been lost in, in practice, I think. Um, but the idea that the founders had that you know, we would arrive at something like consensus or a deliberate sense of the majority through deliberation and talking things out at multiple levels of government. And you know, hearing you talk about uh, you know, say, you know, Bush derangement syndrome or the powerful executive, there is a switch in the way Americans think about executive power. Uh, and I think one, if, if you wanted to date it, it would be, uh, say, Woodrow Wilson's presidency and the writings that Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt give us about the executive being some sort of the national representative who unifies and represents the people within his will. Uh, that seems something very different from from what goes before. Um, and, and also the idea, and this is in the Federalist Papers, of you know, the executive is, is part of what Madison calls, you know, Madison says, wise men realize the need for auxiliary precautions. And so the executive is really part of, like judicial review. Uh, he exercises a veto to check popular impulse rising too too rapidly uh, without proper deliberation. And that's kind of lost once the executive is part of the demos or joining in and emphasizing that he is a leader of their will. And that's, I mean, that's largely how we see presidents now. It's certainly how, I mean, even this idea, every president comes in with the idea, I have a mandate uh, to get things done, or All right, I have to do things in 100 days. Uh, that's not deliberative government. And that's, you know, these sorts of aspects of American constitutionalism have been lost. Well, what uh, one of the reasons why power tends to concentrate in the office of the presidency is that he's the only person elected by the country at large. When you have a quarrel between the presidency and Congress, for example, it, it might be it, it's a quarrel between a president elected by the entire country versus um, a group of congressmen fractious congressmen spread across the country and a speaker of the house from some small town in Ohio. It's really no contest. Um, yeah. That's different in a parliamentary regime, of course. I mean, um, Stephen Harper in Canada is a member from Calgary South, right? Just yeah. one little riding. Yeah. Um, yeah but, 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 Go ahead. No, no. Well, I, you know, and I guess, you know, just thinking too of, and I, and I think this may not be really intention with your argument, but maybe support that I suppose is you know, the willingness of Congress uh, in the face of the administrative state going on several decades now, I think, to see itself as a manager 
of the administrative state and, and instead of a body that uh, controls it and uses it for its own ends, it's, it's happy to delegate. Of course, the non-delegation principle is largely a dead letter, but it's happy to delegate in broad terms, take credit for passing legislation, uh, but, and then only hold itself accountable by way of public hearings where it you know, shows that its wishes weren't carried out. And so we have really a failure of self-government there as well, kind of leading into this growth in executive power and uh, you know, the yeah, presidential the, the system presidency, being problematic. The presidency is largely independent of Congress at this point, and yeah. Congress yeah. is yeah. complicit in this. I think, for example, of the way in which the um, power of Congress with respect to policing the debt ceiling has been abandoned by the Speaker. Um, that spending power was to rest in Congress, but now it rests import, most importantly in, in, in the presidency who decides exactly um, who gets the loot. Congress really can't micromanage, and one of the reasons why in all countries there's a concentration of power at the top has to do with the rise of the regulatory state, and of course also the importance of the media in making rock stars out of, out of presidents. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. all of that's to be found in every modern state. The difference is the regulatory state is much more burdensome in this country. As well, compared to other countries, America is a fairly corrupt country and tolerates abuses which um, would not be tolerated in other countries. I'm thinking, for example, of the use of the criminal power to go after people or or the power of the IRS uh, or the EPA to, to punish people uh, with whom one dissents. These things seem to be tolerated more here than they are in, in other first world countries. So not surprisingly, in international comparisons with respect to corruption, America doesn't fare terribly well. I mean, it's ahead of Italy, but that's not a that's a rather low bar. So this, as, as compared to say, you know, the Commonwealth countries or the Nordic countries, it's it's uh, uh, it, it's 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 a country with problems as to corruption, as to the rule of law. And presidential abuses, the abuses of a regulatory state, are part of that. And if one wants to predict where things will be in in, in 40 years' time, of course, one's a fool. One can't do that. But but the signs are point towards a, a, a greater sense of those kinds of abuses. Things get tolerated here, which which wouldn't be so easily tolerated in other countries. Uh, one of the things I mentioned in the book was a suggestion by a deputy campaign manager for Obama in 2012 that Mitt Romney was a felon yes. for some trivial error in securities filings. Sarbanes-Oxley, I think, a filing. There. Yeah. yeah. Um, could be. I think it was Securities and Exchange Act. But it, whatever it okay. was, it's it's a sort of crime which every American commits, essentially. I mean, every, every American is guilty of a felony, roughly. It's only a question of who one decides to prosecute, you know, the Dinesh D'Souza's. Mm -hmm. So um, that didn't become an issue in the campaign, except some people like Andrew Sullivan said, yes, he is a felon. But nobody noticed the descent towards Russian territory, the use of the police power to criminalize political dissent. That's, that should be shocking. I wonder, and just thinking about this idea of regulation by prosecution, so one doesn't have, uh, and I guess I'm confessing my ignorance here, you don't see sort of uh, strong environmental rules in Canada that are enforced against companies by way of prosecution, um, or, or is it just they have very clear standards and everybody kind of knows where they stand? It's more the latter. It's, okay. uh, one doesn't use the criminal power so much. Um, there has been a greater expansion in this country of uh, taking away intent offenses which don't have a mens rea component. That yeah. is offenses which, with an innocent mind, you can commit yeah. and and go to jail for. There isn't also the the well the. the there isn't also the same kind of mindset that the public's an enemy you have to go after. It, it's it's not quite like that. There, there there are there have been abuses with respect to human rights tribunals, but uh, mm -hmm. then again, when those abuses were discovered, Parliament amended the law. They can do that there. <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, no, I love it when you say that. He's <laughs> frequently in the book. I was thinking of, um, uh, of powerful executives as well. Uh, one example that comes to mind, at least, and I'm not a student of Canadian politics, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, and, mm-hmm. and the way, I mean, he seems to be, most people say he largely redefines Canada. Uh, in terms of uh, you know, just the growth of, of, of you know, the government, social welfare policies, et, et cetera, which remain in place. Uh, and you can say that people want them, and I suppose that's a fair point, but remain in place. And, and I was thinking of you know, that example. Then also was, these, yeah. on, on the Freedom House uh, standards. Now, I wanted to ask you this. So when America ranks, and I, and I forget, I know I've read somewhere we rank like 18th. Maybe that's the Heritage Wall Street Journal, which is really shocking. Yeah. Um, but what are we really talking about? I mean, because it seems to me most classical liberals, if they had to choose between America or Canada, uh, and maybe this is becoming a closer call, would still choose America, or even you know the European parliamentary democracies. Go on. You would say most would choose America. Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, it's maybe it's, it's becoming a closer call. But in a in a in a if you had well, a perfect choice, because, yeah, I have a simple answer for that: ignorance. <laughs> you see, most Americans uh, sensibly don't think very often about other countries, whereas people in other countries sensibly think more often about the United States. Um, I've seen, I've seen all three countries, but most are four countries with France, but I've I've mostly seen Canada and the States. I don't have a sense that I'm free or here, just the opposite. But this is so subjective. Freedom House, as as it happens, ranks both, gives both countries, all three countries, top rankings. Okay. All you know from 1972 onwards, but yeah. but but freedom is is such a very difficult thing to measure. Um, on economic freedom, I think that Cato and Heritage and Fraser and so on have it right that America is descending down the ranks and that Canada is freer. In fact, I I think that they give too much credit to America. They're, they're economists, not lawyers, and they don't appreciate the rule of law problem in this country, yeah. um, which is much less of a problem in other countries. So, um, what, what about the so geopolitical? Part of it, part, part, let, let me continue. Part, sure. part of this is, is simply ignorance, but, but the other part of it is, that, is, is simple patriotism. When you think of Americans who worry about this sort of thing, I'm principally conservatives, um, they're all... F- Patriots first and philosophers second. That is, um, most Americans, even libertarians, are Americans first and libertarians second. That um, they really aren't able to objectively compare the regimes in different countries where that might seem to ask them to devalue the United States. And, you know, that's just as it should be. People should be patriotic. Mm -hmm. But the view from, the objective view from some third country is is that uh, America is not in the top ten anymore, or and, and, and that it's descending in terms of liberty. That, you know, curiously, countries like Denmark, you know, the Nordic countries do very well. Another message in all of this is that you can have socialized medicine, as Canada does, and yet uh, be freer than the United States. And, and looking at that, what Americans should do is pay more attention to the problems of liberty in this country, which include the rule of law problem, and also include the, the rising concentration of power and the unaccountability of the executive power, the president, who makes laws as he wa- wants and who uh, doesn't enforce laws as he wants, and who can ignore Congress, and who is given a free ride by the press, um, and who depends only, I guess, upon the electorate every four years. And it's a very different electorate, isn't it, than the kind of electorate that it once saw in America, say, 30 or 40 years ago. No, I, I, I you know, one of the things I wanted to come back and, and ask you on the unaccountable executive, and, and I'm more and more inclined to agree with you, particularly as I've read Michael Grava's writings on the administrative state, which I think he's, he's really emphasized uh, the problems of we don't even, you know, the way we conservatives have thought about this thing for the past 30 years doesn't even seem to fit, uh, given the mm-hmm. new ways it's working. And I think that's an important point. I want to ask you, we do have uh, a president who has felt the need, particularly after 9-11, to come before the Congress and get authorization uh, to use military force. We just saw in Syria, Obama would not 
um, uh, mm-hmm. do anything there with because he didn't think he had the support in Congress and he didn't want to formally go before and get voted down. Um, uh, and it, it seems to me, so at least the use of force, uh, I almost wonder there is a consensus that you need Congress behind you. Of course, Congress holds the power of the purse. It's reluctant yeah, I, I, to you. I would, yeah, I would, I would disagree with you in a couple of, in a couple of ways. I mean, first of all, as uh, I recall the crucial event before America, before Obama decided not to do anything, was the vote in Parliament in Westminster, where Cameron thought he had a majority. Yeah, that mattered, yeah. That 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 mattered uh, very importantly, um, but the other thing is I, th- I think Congress is really not a player when it comes to the war power. Now, if, if you go back to the Framers' debate, you'll find people like George Mason saying, "The idea that a president can take us into war just by himself is abominable." But that that's roughly where it is. The the War um, Powers Resolution of 1974 has been ignored by all presidents. Um, it's true, as you say, that presidents often will seek uh, advice from Congress before doing so, but that, firstly, is not a necessary thing to do. And it's not even sufficient to uh, bind Congress and to uh, immunize yourself from criticism thereafter if you're the president. I'll tell you why. Because whenever you do go to Congress... Uh, people in the other party will ensure that they vote the way the president wants, but they'll also uh, give a majority of votes on the other side to us so as to give themselves deniability. And moreover, uh, you can be for it and then be against it afterwards, as John Kerry and Hillary Clinton were. You can vote in favor of a resolution, as, as they did in 2002, the Iraq resolution, and then decide they were against it afterwards. So there's... You know, they can change their mind, and and it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I mean, law. I mean, we we should expect log rolling to happen. I mean, I think you know, before Gulf War One, uh, there was there was the vote uh, approving force, if I remember correctly, and, and I remember mm-hmm. a senator from my home state, you know, w- like withheld support unless he could actually speak during the main hour, so the entire country saw him on the on the cameras. Al Gore, I'm talking about, but yet, <laughs> you know, but I mean. <laughs> We would expect that uh, in politics. And of course, you know, John Kerry said that, but now was argued that was one of the crucial reasons why he lost in 2004. Nobody believed what he said. They thought he wasn't uh, trustworthy. I, I, uh, I, I don't know. I, I just, as I was thinking about that, and of course, it seems really the biggest player in the financial crisis. Of course, we did have the Treasury Department, which, I mean, it, it is still learning about the things they said to bank executives. But um, you know the, the Fed. The Fed was huge, and uh, I guess it's it's you know an independent agency, uh, sort of part let, of the executive. Let, but that let me, was let they me were go the big back player. to the war power yeah. for a moment. Um, Polybius, two thousand years ago, figured this out. He said that the reason why Rome was a great imperialist state was because during war, all war powers were concentrated in two consuls, and he said that. By contrast, where one required the support of something like a Spartan parliament, that didn't work so well for imperialistic wars. It worked fine for defensive wars. You got the country behind you for a defensive war. But for an ambitious imperialist war, then what you really needed was one or two people who could decide things all by themselves. Um, There is something called the diversionary hypothesis in the literature, The diversionary uh, hypothesis holds that presidents like to go to war for internal, not external reasons. When you think about it, there aren't too many countries that threaten the United States right now. But nevertheless, the United States does embark on wars. The diversionary hypothesis, which is a wag-the-dog story, would have it that uh, one wants to go to war where, for example, unemployment is high and you want to distract or there is a sexual scandal and you want to divert attention from that. Um, So right now you have this absolutely wonderful bauble that's given to elected presidents. 41% of the world's military spending in the hands of one person who can do more or less whatever the heck he wants. Um, Of course, in the case of Obama, he isn't doing very much, but that's, that's a different matter. That's because he wants to divert spending from military to social welfare purposes. And so that's yeah. what leading from behind is all about, I think. As for, uh, and you mentioned then the uh, the Fed, 
and the financial crisis. And let me let me let me hold you up for one minute yeah. because I mean, and this was a question I wanted to ask you a few minutes ago. In, in thinking about America's role relating to the other Western parliamentary democracies, it's just our geopolitical role itself. Um, mm-hmm. and, and and you know, my, my libertarian friends will quibble with me, but uh, or not quibble, but strongly disagree. Uh, but given the amount of interest that we have, given our role in seemingly guaranteeing free trade globally. Uh, this would have to factor into how you evaluate uh, economic freedom, political freedom in America and the other countries, because they can largely live off the, the security that's provided by the American military and the enormous resources that are required to keep that thing going. There's a lot of free riding that's been going on on the part of other countries. It's paid for uh, a more expansive welfare state, in particular for things like Medicare. Um, that's not necessarily where we are right now, of course, but that was certainly true during the Cold War. Wouldn't you say even even global free trade, though, now depends a large measure on the reach of the American Navy and Air Force to actually keep lanes open and to keep to keep it moving, keep it secure? I mean, that just seems uh, that just seems real to me and a part of a part of our system. Possibly so. Um, one might believe in that more if, if America were more of a free trade country. It's a rather protectionist country mm-hmm. compared to a lot of other countries. Yeah. Other countries are going ahead negotiating free trade agreements with the Orient and with uh, yeah. Yeah. Europe, yeah. which which America isn't at this point. So, you, you know, I, I don't think protection of free trade is the sort of thing a protectionist president is all that interested in. Yeah, recently, yeah, we've we've definitely seen yeah, more of that uh, recently. No, you're right. So I didn't mean to interrupt you. Talk, uh, get to your point on the no, Fed. No, 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 no. That's right. Um, yeah, uh, well, a good example of the reach of presidential power, I guess, is provided by the financial crisis and the enormous discretion the president had with respect to bailouts of unions and uh, and the ability to use the power of the regulators to bring banks into uh, the bailouts. Okay. Uh, this this, this yeah. is quite surprising and quite shocking. I'm thinking, for example, of things that John Allison yes. said about uh, BB&T Bank and the yeah. way they were pressured to participate in the bailout. Well, I, I think, uh, and I, I'm free blanking on the name of the political scientist that wrote this, uh, the paper Regulation by Deal. I don't know if if you've read that, but he he really explores the ways Hank Paulson and uh, uh, I'm blanking on his name right now. We're actually using their powers to force deals to happen. Ben Bernanke. Yeah, yeah. Ben Bernanke, and uh, uh, I don't think of the New York Fed chair at the time who's now become the. But yeah, interesting, uh, interesting, uh, uh, amazing things there. Um, maybe we can end and. Uh, so it's been kind of a depressing conversation. That's not good. <laughs> so I mean, in terms of something I keep thinking about is Congress reclaiming uh, what what Publius thought it would always have, which is ambition yeah. to maintain the power of its office and push against the executive. Uh, so yesterday, the big story in the Washington Post, or I guess two days ago, breaks the CIA has been actually, you know, you know, watching the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, and I don't I don't know what to make. I mean, that seems like a bad story. I'm not out of the facts yet, all of the facts, but. I mean, things like this is like Congress is just held in contempt almost by the executive agencies. And when are you going to realize your powers, man? Yeah, um, that even got some of the well, that that's even gotten the the Senate Democrats upset. Yeah, I think that's I I think you've raised the most important question of all. So how do we go back? Uh, A lot of people have suggested amendments to the Constitution, which I think are basically impossible. Uh, there is a con-con crowd, an Article 5 Constitutional Convention uh, crowd of people. Um, I sympathize with that, but I don't think that you'd be likely to emerge with anything like a consensus of what a New Deal would look like. Interestingly, I tested this with students of mine. I said, supposing we had a Constitutional Convention, and Let's vote on things. You know, let's vote on how the president is elected. Would you like to see the president chosen by Congress, for example? Oh, nobody wants that. Well, would you like to have the states appoint the senators? Well, no, no. We, you know, we we know how it works. We vote for our senators. Well, you know, what what about um, you know equal representations of states in 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 the Senate? Well, of course, we want that. 
I think when you get down to it, in short, you'd find that the present regime would probably command the support from nearly all Americans, and you'd be unlikely to change it. So if you say constitutional change isn't on the cards, what can you do? Well, um, you could do a number of really stupid things. You could um, you could bring into the country a whole group of people who like the idea of one man rule by uh, legalizing all of the so-called illegals in this country and giving them the right to vote. Um, but what if you want to make things better? One thing I suggested in the book is a national referendum, hmm. the, uh, which might be done, of course, without constitutional change. So other countries solve some of their vexed problems by putting it to all of the people. Yeah. And uh, curiously, the Lockean Republic of America hasn't done that. Now, one of the problems why, one of the reasons why presidents amass powers as opposed to Congress is the power of the one person as against the mass of people in Congress. So the president can claim he has the legitimacy of all Americans, which is something John Boehner can't say. But if, on the other hand, Congress had a referendum on, say, the, the debt ceiling or spending, then they would have the political legitimacy to hang tight on an issue which now they're willing to surrender to the president. That's one way of, of possibly doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I'd also like to see impeachment. I'd like to see impeachment when presidents misbehave, and I'd like to see impeachment when um, presidents abuse their office, and I'd like to see impeachment just for the spirit of the thing. But, of course, we won't have that. Well, yeah, you're, I, th I think you're probably right. <laughs> Frank, this has been a great discussion. The book is The Once and Future King, The Rise of Crown Government in America. We've been talking with author Frank Buckley. Thank you so much for, for coming and talking with us. Thanks so much, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links relevant to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at libertylawtalk.org. Oh,